And welcome to another episode of the Never Image Radio podcast. I'm Chris DiNardo. And this is Pat Bruno. All right, so um, spinning off the Hall of Fame topic we had uh, a couple weeks back, right. you found something interesting that you yes. wanted to you wanted to ask me about on air. Yeah, well, they pulled out um, uh, fifty their greatest bass players, right? All right, just from the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. just the people that are in the Hall of Fame, right? Are yeah. the bands? Yeah, not like total, right? Everybody, but um, um, well, Gene made it thirty four. That's what actually maybe check it out interesting um, but i'm not here to debate who goes 30 who goes 20 who goes 10 it's just right. you know as long as you get the top 10 top 15 right i guess you could be good but you know what surprised me at number 50 was dd ramon why did that surprise you because he's just uh -huh. doing what the guitar is doing well i listen i don't think dd's should make any list not knocking the ramones ramones a great band fun band Whatever right. you want to say about the Ramones, they're a cool band. I'm not knocking the Ramones, but I don't know. I just, it was just, and listen, I know Ramones stuff and style, and I know what the bass is doing in the songs, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I don't think it's a top 50 um, bass player, if I would have. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to make my list, oh. but I, I love the Ramones. Yeah, but um, I think it was strange that they put him in there. You think because he made was... Uh, punk and then uh, they needed a punk bass player in there well if there's there's 50 bands right that you could think of with great bass players right i mean you think they might have ran out of people i don't know i'm I think, sure there's more than 50 bands in the, in the hall of fame i mean gene simmons is 35 or 34 whatever right. you said i don't know yeah. Not, well, I don't even know how they make the list anyway. Like, what's what's the data they use to put somebody 34 I would or think if it's a Hall of Fame vote right. that um, they're going to poll everybody in the Hall of Fame right. and tally up the votes that way. So you think Dee got a couple of votes to get in? Yeah. Then that's yeah, but how, he shouldn't even have been really nominated. Well, it's all bass players. I or know. you could write them in. Right. I guess. I mean, I don't know. That's well, interesting, though. I mean, I think that if you look at the top 10, I can't remember the top 10. Of course, Paul McCartney was number one. No right. argument over that. No. But it's just whatever you want to put. You know, of course, you know, John Paul Jones is in there. You know, all the top bass Was Geezer Flea. Butler in the top yeah. 10? You know, Geezer's in it. I don't know if he broke the top 10, but he's up there like maybe 11, 12. Or he might be in the top 10. I don't remember the whole list, but he's definitely up there. Was Getty Lee in the top five? He was definitely in the top 10. I don't remember where he landed at. Okay. And the Flea's in there, of course. Um, what's his name from the Who? John Entwistle. Yeah, I think he might have made it number two or number three. John Entwistle. Yeah, they, they 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 put him up there. Well, deservedly, of course. But like I said, after like you get to twenty bass players, and how you kind of make you know, yeah, you know, what's his name, Cliff Burton, right? I think he just made it out of the top ten, so it's cool to see him in there, you know, because that style of sure he's playing yeah well he was phenomenal oh without a doubt. I mean, it's crazy he was how that good fast he was. with his fingers. He was just you know. You know, there was like no pocket for him. Like, 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 uh, what's his name from um, Paul McCartney? You know, because how the songs were structured, he was allowed to play a lot of, you know, a lot of those walking bass lines. And, you know, he also did a lot of the, he also did a lot of great bass work with Wings. Oh, yeah. Like, Wings is another great band, dude. Great um, band. Yeah, band definitely. Bass. Like, when you think about it, the, the bass playing on like, and the bass production on like a song, like say silly love songs, right? How much that bass stand bass, <laughs> how much the bass stands out yeah, and how much it's up in the production. Yep. Very rounded sounding. Definitely. Um, Definitely. it's very, it reminds me of like the old FM radio sound of the seventies, okay. which, it, which I love. And I still try to bring in my production and everything. It's funny, like when people listen to this stuff, it's like, yeah, it doesn't sound like loud and it doesn't sound so digital. And it's right. like, you know, I'm not going for that. You know, I'm not going for that like polished, um, digitally enhanced, cranked, brick walled volume up in your face production. I like everything to sound like it came from an FM radio right. in your uncle's car in the right. set in 1978. That's how I like to produce. 
Yep. So, but uh, I guess with lists and everything, it's all like anything else. It's subjective, it and is. anything we talk about on the oh, show is always, is always okay. subjective. Now you probably got some rural fans going crazy. No, you should be definitely be in there. Now listen, I'm not arguing really. You don't deserve, but. You know, he's not a great bass player. I mean, that's kind of obvious. I mean, listen, I mean, you give me a couple days that I could do the whole set list and probably go on tour with them. I mean, it's just, <laughs> no, I'm being serious. I mean, I'm not knocking you, but it's not that difficult to play those bass lines. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, I yeah. As long as you're fast on one hand, and as long as you could, you know, your right hand could pick pretty fast, you'd be all I, right. I'm, I think he wrote a lot of the songs too. Okay. So maybe that's why. I it's don't possible. Know. Yeah. Who knows? So. Well, Dee Dee makes it at number 50. So, um, who are your favorite bass players, if you had to pick? The well, Pat Bruno top five. Oh, offhand? Yeah, off. of course offhand. Well, when I listen to Zeppelin, okay, the first thing I listen to is John Paul Jones. Right. I can listen to him all day. I'm a guitar player, and Jimmy Page is like this, and I just hear John Paul Jones, man. He, his bass lines in Zeppelin, is just, every song is great. He's busy. Very busy bass player. He's always filling something, and there's not no, you know. And right off the top of my head, I'm thinking about like the end of the chorus and the immigrant song. Okay. Yeah. It's like crazy. And I mean, he also good, had to lock in with uh, all his songs, dude. With good, John Bonham. Yeah, good times, bad times. Yeah. <laughs> he's just he's got some cool stuff going on in every part, you know. Um, that's the first thing I hear when I hear Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't listen to the drums or. Jimmy Page. I mean, of course I hear it, but you just like, he jump Paul Jones, even if the production, you can hear the bass is so full. Yeah. You know, it's really loud and you can hear everything and just amazing stuff. Everything he touched on Zeppelin is amazing, John Paul Jones. And his keyboard stuff too. Yeah. So. Yeah, so. You got mean, him in there? It, like I could do my top five very easily. Of course it is, you know. I love Paul McCartney. Of course. Uh, I think a lot of his stuff he did with the Beatles was just amazing. And like, like just even a song like All My Lovin'. Right. Are you familiar? Yeah, of course. I mean, the way he... Doom, 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 it's very... All his stuff, dude. Yeah, I, I love it. All the the best. Geezer I love. Sure. Of course, Getty Lee. Yep. Is probably my favorite. And... um I don't know. Who else is there? I'm not really a bass player. No, me neither, but... It's hard to think about. John Paul Jones, definitely. And um, I guess I would have to go with uh, Les Claypool from Primus. I know you're not too much of a Primus guy, no, but, but... his bass playing, if you just go by his bass playing, is phenomenal. I yeah. Mean, I, don't, I don't get the whole music of it, but his bass playing alone is, you know... Amazing. Well, the beauty of his bass playing is the same thing about Primus. Um, and the most remarkable thing about that band is that there's no description for it. It's right. just the name of the band. Right. Like you couldn't possibly tell somebody what Primus sounds like. It's Primus. Well, I told a bass player a while ago who didn't know Primus. That's okay. weird. I know. And um, he's a good bass player. He knows a lot of stuff, classic stuff. He's more of the classic stuff. But he's a very good, talented bass player. Uh -huh. And um, he was like, didn't he, he loved it. But mm -hmm. he was like, dude, you, you need him to like, know, like, you can play bass like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, the way his style was. He's like, dude, because I'm watching him on, you know, videos. Like, dude, it's like, he goes, I don't even want to attempt to play it. Right. Because he's got to learn a new style of playing. You know right. what I'm saying? So he really dug it. As a bass player, you got to get into that stuff because you find something new. You know what I'm saying? That's just always something he's doing in here. It's like probably new, you know? So I mean, total respect, total respect for him. He's great bass player. The band, I never connected with it. And I really never. Well, Primus is, you know, pr I was about to bring up M Misa from Bandmaid, but as far as like a new bass player. Um, but the thing with Primus is that they created something that doesn't exist as far as like a music sound. Oh, or no, a I hear band it. And sure. So there's elements of jazz, there's right. elements of metal, there's elements of like ska, yep. there's elements of just. Well, even a guitar work he's he kind of sounds like he's playing like out of key sometimes like he's like making you know he's yeah. making up notes as he as yeah. the song is going so yeah. it's kind of has that weird sound going because he might be playing something you know most of the mo most of uh his solos he just jump in b and just go crazy that's it and just it's just like weird one thing i always noticed a perfect cover for primus 
And it was like the first Primus song I heard before Primus even existed. But it's the same style. And it's um, a Torpedo Girl by Kiss with Ace Fairly song. Yeah, that right. could be a Primus song. What I doubt is it got that drum beat going on and with the guitar work. Yes. It's t- I can hear it. And hear right. Ace's good guitar. Call. Yeah, good call. It's like it's a Primus song. Yep. So, you know, a lot of people knock that album and not kiss for not being musical, but Ace really messed with some weird tuning on that album. Yep. That was probably a G, his G tuning. Yeah. Right? That, that Keith Richards yep. nonsense. And then, you know, introduced that. Yeah. You Good know, call. You're, you're right. I'm, I can hear it right now. That's got that weird sound going in the beginning. You got Anton on drums, kind of playing the yep. same type of drums. So I don't know why Primus never covered torpedo girl. It's like the perfect thing for them to cover. I don't even know the song. No, he come on. Let's know his kiss. Yeah, you, Torpedo Girl though at all the kiss songs. You gotta be a kind of like a diehard to know that song. I mean, look at Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl's covering Ozone, you know, off Ace's solo album. So it's like people know like the obscure stuff, you know? Oh, I think he's more of a hardcore fan. Not a hardcore fan, but he's probably more of a kiss fan, Dave. And you know what band Les Claypool famously tried out for, right? And didn't get the <clears> gig. <throat> Should I know this? It's rock history, man. Take really? a guess. I know. I don't know. And it was before Primus broke. And they lost their bass player in a tragic bus accident. Oh, Metallica. Yeah. Okay. I remember that when they were, they were auditioning bass players. Yeah. He, uh, he came in. I think there's a video of it, right? Les came in? No, that was, you're thinking about the further down the line when they were, you know, auditioning bass players for, for replacing Jason Newstead. Okay, okay, yeah, all right. But um, he's like, uh, James was like, when they heard it, they were like, what yeah. the hell are we going to do with this? Yeah. Like, they knew the guy was great. Yeah, and it wouldn't worked out. It probably would have been like. And Kurt was in high school with him. Right. So he knew him from back in the day. Interesting, yeah. But yeah, it's that's strange. I mean, think about like a lot of bands like that wanted that people auditioned for. How many drummers didn't Charlie Benante audition for Kiss mm-hmm. when Peter Chris left? Yeah. Anthrax drummer. You had um who else was some of the famous like you had Kurt Cobain wanted Jay Maskis from Dinosaur Jr. Yeah. to join them on drums <laughs> and then on guitar. Yeah. Afterwards. That would've, that would've, that would've been a great combination though. I think that would have I mean, of course, you know, Nirvana's you would have had, legendary, but with Jay on the guitar. So if Jay it took Pat Smear's spot, right, yeah. on guitar. It would be crazy. Yeah. And then you would have had James. Oh, James. You would have had Dave Grohl. You would have had Jay Maskus and Kurt Cobain. That would have been nuts. Who? The, could you imagine the songs that would have came from that band? I know. Yeah, that's like. That would have been interesting. Interesting. Yeah. More than interesting, to say the <laughs> least. So. But that's cool with that. All right. What I want to bring up now is totally change the subject into another area is, um, uh, as you know, I'm a big horror movie fan. Um, going back though, I'm not really a fan of like new horror. Have you seen a new horror movie that you liked in the past 20 years? As much as you like the old ones. I think, um, I guess, I don't know if Saw is considered a horror flick, but... Of course it is. Okay, well, Saw. Did you like it? Yes, the first one was great. Yeah? I mean, it was one of the best movies I've seen in horror, you know. That's, really? Yeah, I loved it. What I didn't think... First Saw? Really? Yeah, I didn't... Wow. Didn't you don't think do, it was... Really? I'm not saying it was an awful movie, but it didn't move me well, like... Well, in 20 years, well, that's what I came up with. So, I mean, that's... I think that was done well. It was written well, it was different in a mm-hmm. way and i think the ending was i don't know if you remember the ending no no clue well i mean don't tell me because I'll, I'll go back and watch it and be surprised all right so well then i, I could probably give it away to you now you're gonna be paying attention to it well i think i would have i would have guessed because i'm pretty good at guessing shit like yeah. that well so. i thought the ending was one of the best endings of uh, a horror flick wait a minute is it that movie where he's He's one of the people getting chased the whole movie, no. and he turns out to be him. No, it was, it was two guys in the. I think it was two guys. I went a while since I watched it in the bathroom, 
um, like chained up and stuff. He was always, he was a guy dead there. He was always in that bathroom. So and that's what I remembered. I thought that he was in the, you have to watch it. I got to yeah. watch it again too. It's been a while, but I thought Saw was one of those movies that, you know, was good in the last whatever years. I don't even know when that came out. It's been a while, right? Since yeah. that one came out. So I got to watch it again. But I, I remember that the ending was really um, interesting. I know the guy was in the bathroom that was the, the killer. Right. And he was there like all the time. What are your What are your other favorite horror movies of all time? <sighs> you know, I got a couple of ones, but you got a good horror collection, dude. I mean, you got some you got some weird ones in there too that I like actually, but you got a good collection. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's you, know, uh, you got everything. You got stuff for people that I've even heard of or even known that exists. That's true. Yeah, but um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what are some of your classics? I mean, I, I do have some ones. I don't know if I want to shout them out, but uh, for me, I love uh, Fun House, which was directed by the guy who directed Chainsaw Massacre, the original one. Very nice. So Why didn't he make it a remake of that one? The Fun House, or not? I'm they better it. not. They yeah. remake all my shit. They remade Suspiria. Did you see that? No. The remake is Suspiria. You? Yeah. Well, I know you're a big fan of that. What you think of the I liked it better than I thought I would. Really? Yeah. Okay, so they did a good job. The reason why I liked it is because they went totally off. Like, it was the same movie, kind of, but they took an entirely different approach to it, and it worked. Wasn't scary. Wasn't as scary at all. It was just more weird. Like they had a trailer and everything for yeah. it? Yeah. They did, like a television? They, yeah. Hmm. It was, uh, I don't know, I don't know on that. television, but I know they... Well, was, you know, like you see a commercial, but the trailer, I mean... Didn't, right. Was, no? No. It wasn't like that. Okay. That's why, why I didn't know. And it was a lot of focus on the dancing because of, you know, dance was a huge part of, of the remake. Not right. so much the original, even though they were dancers away, but a lot of the choreography in this movie was weird right. and bizarre and it like worked so from an art standpoint it worked cinematography wise not even close to the original but they did a really 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 good job you know um and i didn't feel like i was watching the original suspiria or watching a movie that was just basically a remake yeah totally different and the ending totally threw me for a loop. It was a different ending? Um, yeah. It's just way, yeah. Dude, I didn't even know they existed, so I gotta, I get, definitely got to check the, the remake of that. It was it was good. Um, what do you think about some of the classics, like, you know, Halloween and Friday the 13th, or like the original first ones, where they still will be, like, in the list of yours? Would you throw them in there like Halloween? Would you well, if I'm going to go Halloween, yeah. The reason why is because I love John Carpenter as a filmmaker. Right. And if you go back in time, there were no movies like that. No. There were no movies with the guy with the mask coming to kill you. Yep. And it was the first one of its kind. And it was it worked. horrifying. Without a doubt. And I don't know if you go back and watch the original Halloween recently or have you watched it in a while? No, it's been a while since I've watched it. You'll be surprised how many times you see him walking around in that movie. Yeah. Like in the background, yeah. crossing the street, peeking out from a bush yep. all over that movie. I and I never recognized it. And I have like the Blu-ray. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I notice that? Yep. The reason why I like the original Halloween is there is no why. This guy is just evil yep. and he doesn't say anything and there's no story. Did you see the last one? Yeah. Okay. I liked it. wasn't wasn't like superb, no, but it was. It fit. Yeah. For what it is, you, you know, you watch it for you know what you're getting. You know what I'm saying? I, Could have been a lot worse. Oh yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. and it was it was good. I heard he's coming back again. Yeah. You heard too. Yeah. As far as Friday the Thirteenth, you mentioned that. I think that Friday the Thirteenth Part Two mm -hmm. is one of the best horror movies ever made. Really? Yeah. If you watch that start to finish. I got to go back and watch it because I can't remember part one from part two. Part two is great. I just can't remember which was which. Yeah, the suspense and he was just running around with that sack on his right. head. I think he gets the hockey mask in part three. Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. They wait to the third one from they get that mask on? Yeah, I think hmm. so. Because the part two was still in the cabin in Crystal Lake. Right, Crystal Lake. And 
uh, there was a whole cliffhanger and a guy disappears. Remember, she's getting loaded in the ambulance. Where's Paul? Yeah. Where's Paul? It's like, and that's how it ends. Right. So. So, yeah. So the hockey mask came later on. Yeah. And the third one was in 3D. Yeah. Oh, it was bad though. The 3D back then, it wasn't, you know, what it is today. You know, I pretty much watch every movie in 3D. Especially I go to like Star Wars or any kind of. Right. The Avengers. Avengers. I watch those all in 3D. So, you know. I mean, with with horror, the whole horror genre now. Um, I mean, I'm writing a couple of horror scripts, so I don't want to like give too much away in in what I want to see in a horror film because I think it's certainly not present now. But too many people are focused on, um, the fear of the people inside the film, and not trying to hook line and sinker the audience right. you got to scare the shit out of the audience you can't just have your audience watch another person be afraid you have to take the audience and bring them into the film yeah. and i think that was brilliant about halloween oh yeah i was th- about a lot of the the devil flicks like the omen and like rosemary's yeah. baby and things of that nature well, today, that's like, why they're so scary if you go on netflix and you watch like a newer horror flick i, I just don't like any of them you know, it's just not, I don't feel it. You know, they, yeah, there could be some written well, but it's just not, you know, you know, you try like, you, you see a title and you just like, oh, look scary. You know, you try and it's just not, it's not good. To me, I, I love cheesy horror flicks. You know, I, I, I don't mind watching a cheesy horror flick. You know, I enjoy it. Yeah, they're mindless, stupid, yeah, and I just mean, I, I can wacky enjoy. and fun. Exactly. I could take a serious one, enjoy it, and a cheesy one, but. That's why you love the car. Oh, the car is Awesome, dude. Movie about a car possessed just going around killing people. That was a good movie, dude. With and James I, and Brolin. I watched, I watched all these when I was a kid. And that one scared me, too. It was a car, actually. You got scared of a car. It was possessed, I guess. It was a, the devil in it or something. Yeah. It was just... That was... <laughs> I can't remember that. That was good. The it, car, man. Jeez. That's a great film. Uh, well, with a lot of, like you say, with the next Netflix movies and everything, is that... People are just following these stupid formulas for horror movies, but when the horror movie genre got good, it's when they stopped following the formulas of the 50s and 60s with the monster guy yep. coming at you and stuff like that. It was just yep. weirdness. And there's no weirdness in these films now. Yeah. There's too many people jumping out. There's too much gore. Yep. There's too much torture stuff. It's just, It's just not good. You know, the situation has to be scary that the characters are in. You can't just do like music and like big loud bangs in the editing room to make you scared and stuff. It's just, it's all cliche. There's everything now is a giant cliche. And that's why I don't enjoy it. I can't even recall watching a newer horror flick in a while, really. I, I try some on Netflix here and there. I, I don't even get to watch the whole thing. I kind of get like bored of it. Just kind of. It sucks. It's like wrestling. Yeah. You want to watch it. You want to like it. You want right. to get into what's new, and you can't. Yeah. I tried so hard with wrestling yeah, to get into it. So I'll go on YouTube and just watch, you know, old school matches from yeah. wrestling, and I enjoy that much better. Hell yeah! You know, than watching today's stuff. You know, I could watch a Jimmy Snuka match or something, or you know, an old school Bob Backlund or something. But um, yeah, today I just have no. I don't get it. It's like when I watch wrestling now, it's like watching something I don't even recognize. Yeah. I'm watching two guys that spend way too much time in the gym argue with each other down an aisle. Yeah. And well, the only thing I give the new credit for the new wrestling is just, um, you know, how they put the bodies on the line today. You know, back in the day, they didn't. You know, they didn't do these crazy, like, suplexes off of a fucking building or something. But you know the, what I'm saying? But there's no ring psychology. No, there isn't. That, 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 you know, it, they're just setting up for these bombastic moves so people can go, oh, right. wow. It is. Wait, listen, when was the last time you seen a sunset flip in today's wrestling? That, that stuff doesn't even exist anymore. A drop kick. A drop yeah. kick, like, you know, nobody does drop kicks. I, just, I don't watch it. So no, I'm I just saying, know. I didn't know neither, but I don't think they do drop kicks like they were back in the day. Arm drags. Remember the arm drags the routine used to do? Yeah. Back and forth to the arm drags. They don't do that shit no more today's like you know jumping off the top rope into the audience and you know doing a brain buster on the concrete or some shit but it's you gotta give them credit though today they you know 
But they don't have to work as much. The guys back in the day used to do seven days a week. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And if they had to sit out a card, they had yeah. to sit out a card like one night. Yeah. You know? So I, I don't give them that much credit. Their, their mic skills aren't as good. No. And well, that's what all it is today, though. It's all like everybody's on a mic. But it's horrible. It's it not even good. No. It's it's not even good. I'm sure there are some people. I don't know if there's not, but I'm sure if you watch it, I'm sure there are some people. I mean, if you went back uh, to the, I guess they call it the Attitude Era. Right. Where they had The Rock and Stone Cold. They all had great mic skills. Yeah. All of them did. Right. You know, Mick Foley. Uh-huh. I mean, they, at that era, they all had good mic skills. You know, even Triple H and Shawn Michaels. I mean, they were all really good on the mic, you know what I'm saying? Um, today, I don't really know if they're, you know, they're like that, but don't forget the rock and stone cold. They were great. Mm -hmm. You know, they had that, their, their catchphrases and you know, everybody did all their stuff there. So, um, but back, like getting back to what we were talking about with horror films, that's, um, I don't recognize what it is because the tone of the movie is, is not authentic to me. It's fake. I mean, look at the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Why did that scare the shit out of people? Dude. Because it was shot Great. in it was shot in like unprocessed sixteen millimeter news film. Yeah, but and it looked like a news film because right. back in the day in the seventies, you know, all the way probably up to like nineteen eighty one, eighty two, they used film cameras for the news reports. So that whole film looked like a news report. No, it, but it looked real. Yeah, it was. It had a real feeling to it. Yeah. 16 millimeter. I mean, when she like runs out of the room and into that, all those bones and everything, and it's just like, yeah, it's, movies aren't shot like that now. It's no. uh, at all. They're, they're too, well, I don't want to say polished because they're not even polished. It's just not good. Like somebody needs to take a lighting class. Yeah. Like the films on Netflix are like blown the fuck out. Yeah. Like, you know? It's just not good. So, you know, my horror films are from the ones that are, you know, basically, you know, late 60s at, through the 70s. Like, I think, like, 68 to, like, 83 was, like, my window of horror films. Right. And after that, mm -hmm. it didn't, you know, because then you got, like, Nightmare on Elm Street, like, yeah. with Freddy and Jason and, like, yeah. and videos on MTV. Yeah. And then Scream came well, the, out. Well, and it was just, it, like, it's not fun anymore. Even with the Halloweens and... Uh, Friday the 13th, they just kind of, you know, they took something that was great mm -hmm. in the beginning of the first two or three, and then it just went like cheesiness, you know right. what I'm saying? It's like, you know, Jason was one time on a spaceship. Do you ever see that one? I forget what it's called. No. No, they, he was in space. He was like in a spaceship. <laughs> I don't remember which one that was. I'm not lying. Like he, he was frozen or something, and it, he was, he started killing people on a spaceship. <laughs> you don't remember that one? No. Yeah, you got to look that one up. I don't know if I want to. Well, it's that's how bad it got. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember the one he's in Manhattan. Yeah, of course. But no, I'm not lying, dude. I, I hope I saw this, but yeah, he was in a spaceship killing people, man. He was like frozen or something weird. Wow. Yeah. I never, I never saw that one. But that's the thing. It's <laughs> kind of like with horror movies, you gotta, you gotta shake people. You gotta like, and you don't shake people by gore. You don't scare the shit out of people with. Well, I enjoy gore. Obvious. I listen. It's an art form when it's done right, but yeah. it can't overtake the story. Like right. there's too many films like back in the day where it's just over the top goriness. Yep. And it pulls you out of the movie where you're like, oh, I'm watching special effects. No one's actually thinking, oh my god, that's actually happening. You're like, oh wow, look at those special effects. Right. They're good. So anytime you get yanked out of a movie like that, you know, I prefer I prefer the other thing. Like the best example of not using gore as in reservoir dogs. You remember that movie, right? Right. Now they had two choices to go when he's, when he's going to cut the cop's ear off, mm -hmm. they had two scenes that they were going to do where they showed it, where he's slicing the ear off. And if you remember the scene in the movie, they just pan the camera over and you hear the cop scream. Okay. That they was left. Yeah. Exactly. That's my point. It's like, you know, sometimes, being, you know, observing a situation is scarier than watching blood fly all over right. the place. Well, I'd take example Jaws, the first Jaws. Okay. He never really saw Jaws. Right. In the beginning, remember? Right. It was always, din, din, 
yeah. the, the, and the person would just get pulled under and that made the movie better than just seeing the whole shark eat the person up every time. Yeah. You know, this way you didn't know, or you didn't really see it. You just heard it coming up, you know, especially yeah. in the beginning. Like it was that in the beginning of Jaws two, where the two people are out like swimming at night right. and the, the girl gets like, sure. take, yeah, that's the first one. I don't remember which one is which that might be the first one. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah I think she went swimming um, by herself. Or our boyfriend was there or something. That's um, a great script. Remember. Some of, some of the other films. Well, that, the reason why they didn't you see Jaws, it was really a story behind that, that they couldn't get the uh, the mechanical shark to work. Right. Majority of the time. So they kind of just like only used it towards the end. You know what I'm saying? Like the beginning, they couldn't get the damn thing to work. So, it, but it was brilliant that it actually worked better for them because, you know, you didn't see the shark, you know what I'm saying? You knew it was coming, you know? And it, the, the the sound effects, you know, then, 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 then it was perfect for it. You know, yeah. he's just, it was just creeping up on you. It was film. coming. Yeah, definitely great. So, so for more with the horror films, um, yeah, another couple of ones I like Silent Rage. Oh, yeah, dude. A great Chuck Norris movie. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's a horror flick. It's kind of weird. Is that what you consider a horror flick? Yeah, I do. Because you got a killer who's on the loose. The okay. only no, reason I'm just asking, sometimes it's kind of tough. What's, you know, horror and what's not horror. Like that one's, I would, that's a, good, that's a great movie regardless if it's a horror or not a horror, but yeah, I would put that in. That's, that's another reason why that movie's great is because it's scary. It's a horror movie, but it's also an action movie right? and it's a cop movie yep. too. So we got like all that stuff in there and you got Chuck Norris doing his karate. Yeah, and you told me something about the movie. I never noticed. Yeah. The sound. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you point that out to me. Never knew that. Yeah. When you don't have, they have sound, but they don't have cheesy music. Right. The music. Right. Yeah. No music at all. Right. And the fight scenes. Right. Yeah. Usually Which, it always, always got something in the background, some kind of, you know, synthesizer or something going on in the background, but nothing. You just hear the punching kick in the dirt and just, you know, mm -hmm. that was a good point for pulling that out. Yeah. So for me with horror though, it's like, I think unfortunately somebody's got a, do something amazing, which happens in the genre all the time. And then you're going to get like 800 movies made off the next great thing. And right. that's what they're going to do. And yeah. um, so find it. for my scripts that I'm working on, I just, um, I really want to scare the hell out of people, but I also want something more to come out of it than just, than what, than just being scared. It's, scripts and stories and films are just cool that way so <laughs> you know all right what else you got give me two of your best concerts you ever seen that you act personally too <sighs> could we take the kiss reunion out of it because obviously seeing kiss reunited on new year's eve um was the best show i've a very really? experience. New Year's said the one from Masco Garden. Yeah, the New Year's one was a lot. I mean, the Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. reunion show was. I mean, like, it has to be ahead of no, that one. Here's here's why I. I mean, I, I was I as I explained in the in the in a previous show, I didn't know where the hell I was for the first four songs. Right, I, was, I felt the same way. I just stared. So, but at the New Year's Eve one, I was I was at a party. I was at a rock and roll party. <laughs> I, I was there. I was 11th row on Ace's oh, yeah, side. Row? Yeah. Nice. On Ace's side on the floor. Nice. That was, I had, I had the, that was the most fun I've ever had at a show in my life. Well, wow. not even close. All right. And so we're going to take that one out because there's really no comparison to that. So I'll throw one up there. Seeing, Seeing Quicksand reunite. Really? Yeah. When they got back together, their first show in New York City. Okay. Um, that was, it was more than I was prepared for. I got emotional. I get emotional. Sometimes I cry at shows. People don't mm. even notice. <laughs> yeah. It's not that cry when you're sad, but it's, no, it's, it's a good cry. It's the way my brain is wired. Right. When I get overwhelmed with too much happy emotions, yeah, like I start to cry. 
That's all right. And that's just how my brain is wired. Right. And I got no problem with that. I just, you know, I'm not like sitting there like weeping, like, you know, <laughs> my dog died. It's not uh, like that. It's more, it's more of that, that good, happy cry type right. feeling. And I got those feels. I got that emotion. And when I saw quicksand reunite, what a great show. Nice. What's one of yours? Cause I got a bunch, well, man. Uh, besides kiss massacre garden opening night. I mean, that's, It'll always be special. I mean, I thought I would never, you know, see that. Right. I got the chance Nobody to see did. That. No. So that, believe it or not, will be uh, <clears throat> the Heaven and Hell lineup with um, oh. uh, Dio and Sabbath. Right. I didn't think I would ever see that lineup. And I got to see that lineup twice. But the first time I got to see them, um, it was great. I really. I, was I, that at Radio City? No. I wish I went to that. Do it, please. I mean, I was. <laughs> Where did you see them? Um, Garden State Arts Center. Okay. Yeah, no, that's on DVD, that one from um, Radio City. Great show. I mean, I wish I I would love to be. Anyway, I got to see them, and, you know, it just was just something special. Seeing, you know, because you know my favorite albums, Heaven and Hell, our first two albums, that one and um, Mob Rules. But, and it only played Dio era songs. Right. I mean, there was no, you know, Ozzy song. So that's why right. they called it Heaven and Hell. So right. there was no Ozzy song. So, I enjoyed it. One of the greatest things, dude. I mean, for me, because that's my favorite lineup. And um, I didn't think chance of ever get to see Dio with Sabbath. Play. So why didn't you see the Radio City one? It just didn't, I didn't know it was kind of happening or where it was at. It was supposed to be a one-off show, really. Um, it just, I just didn't go, you know what I'm saying? And you didn't think he was going to pass away. No. I mean, that's the thing with shows, and that's what everybody's got to understand. You got a chance to go to a show. Right, do it. Go. Yep. Don't ever put that off. Yep. Because I made that mistake with Nirvana, and I, I, I'm enough mm -hmm. said. <laughs> you got a chance to see them, I know. You know? Well, I got to see that lineup twice, so. And believe it, the first one was with uh, Megadeth. That oh, was, that's a good that show. was cool. And the second time was with um, Motorhead. Okay. And Judas Priest. Right. So that's like... Judas a, Priest and Rob Halford? Yeah. Okay. So that's like, you know, metal. You know what I'm saying? That was right. cool shows. But, um, that, you know... Did you ever see Motorhead in a club? No. Oh, my God. That's another experience. You really? have no... You thought you heard loud yeah. volume at a club. I saw them um, in South Jersey. Um, they sounded... It, did, it was incredibly loud and incredibly clear. Usually you see a band and they're loud and you're like, oh, get me out of here. And then you get to the car and you're like, ears are ringing. Right. Motorhead was so loud and so clear. It was great. What a great sound. Well, I, I saw Allison Chain one time at the uh, Roseland Ballroom. With Lane or no? Yeah. With the original Allison Chain. Yeah. All right. That was great. All right. I didn't, I, was more, I never got a chance to see the original lineup. I was more like arena guys right. back in those days. Uh -huh. When I got to see them, yeah, Roseland's like, Maybe fifteen hundred people, two thousand yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, it was so loud, and you felt like the bass coming through yeah. your body. It was a different experience to see, you know, that kind of power coming out of, um, you know, it was so loud. I could probably understand what you're saying about Motorhead. Yeah, so, I mean, I felt it that night. I never felt that at an arena show. When no. I felt it that, that night, I was at the Roseland in yeah, New right. York City, and um, and I was. Packed in there like a sardine. I mean, that's a, that's a good point. That's why I don't really like arena shows. No, you can't feel that experience. Because it's not cranked. It's not no. loud. The volume well, it, is It set. is cranked. I mean, I'm sure you put that arena set up in a, in a you know, place like that, it's going to be loud. Yeah, but if we're in an arena show, right. I could have a conversation with you. Right? If we're Almost, in a, if right. If we're in a club, <laughs> no, you're not. It's, you're, no. it's not happening. Especially Roseland back in the day. I well, saw White I, Zombie there. Yeah, it's probably loud. The original White Zombie. Okay, cool. So I was that was good. And do it, and we're packed in there, dude. Like you couldn't move. You were like this, right? And, you know, if there's everybody swaying like this, you're going with it, man. I mean, you know? think about it. I did you ever see Kiss in a small club? No. Okay, I saw Kiss at this uh, at the small club. Okay, I saw them. I saw them at the Ritz, and um. Different experience, right? It was the first, it was um, when they got together with Eric Singer, right? It was 92. So it was the, before they went on, or it could have been, I don't know, Doring or whatever. They did club dates on the Revenge. Yeah, I remember. 
so it was it was before the tour because I remember hearing Unholy, mm-hmm. uh, I Just Wanna, sure. uh, for the first time. Yeah. Um, Domino. Yep. And I remember li- leaving there going, this is the greatest Kiss album ever. Oh my God, did you, you hear I Just mind. Wanna? <laughs> that was the best Kiss yeah. song I heard and it's going to be out. And then you your hear mind, it, you're your like. Your changed quick after yeah, that, right? it does. But I'm, when you hear live club music, I think that's what rock and roll is, is meant to be. It's not meant to be in an arena. I don't know, man. It's the worst of stadiums. Oh, you want to talk God. about sound? Sound just travels. Yeah, yeah. it's the worst to see a band. They bring, I saw the Scorpions in the, the Birch Hill nightclub. That's where I saw Motorhead. Okay. I mean, don't forget, a few years back, Scorpions was a big arena band. Yeah. And at that time, they kind of fizzled out because they knew, you know, that, that era, the 90s music was coming out. So they faded out a little bit. Dude, it was, it's, you know, this, I was right there. I mean, but it, there's no rows. I was probably like three people back from the stage. I just seen the Scorpions, you know, the big MTV man, just to watch him that in a small place. I mean, Birch Hill was small. How did they sound? Oh, it was great. Yeah. You, you know, was, Scorpions always play tight. You know what I'm saying? The singer is always on the point, and they just are e- really even good. Even that uh, original lineup, because they have a couple of tracks that you turned me on to. From the, oh, man. You love that guitar work by that guy. Oh, I just, I just name slips me right now. Um, Uwe John or something. Uwe John Von, Roth. John Uwe John Roth oh, or yeah, something. It's a tough name to pronounce. I can't even say that that song that I like from them. The sales of Sharon. Sharon. There you go. He's opening guitar like riff and lick. It's just like insane for like nineteen. What was it? Seventy seven. Yeah. <laughs> he was like with those runs. Great stuff. No, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, you're right. Clubs. It, it's much better for I'd love to see Rush in a club. Rush is the only band that sounds great in the arena. Now, getting back to like my favorite shows, I would have to say of all the times I saw Rush, for some reason, I mean, all the tours were great, even the last one, and I danced my ass off at Rush shows. I don't know what everybody else is doing. I don't understand the guy. <laughs> like, that's all you see is... He's studying. He's probably a drummer and he's stunning Neil Peart. I'm not that guy at any show. And we're on stage and you look at people and you see guys that look at you like this. It's like they're looking at a bizarre circus animal for the first time. People don't know how to dance. I dance at shows. I'll Mm -hmm. dance at Rush. I can't stand still. Like, you know, so that last Rush show was great. But my favorite Rush show, my favorite Rush tour was the Roll the Bones tour. Right. For some reason, it just... I saw it at Madison Square Garden. That's the one that stands out for me with Rush. And um, I've seen them a lot of times, thankfully, because, you know, they're never going to play again. And that was that was a show worth seeing. Um, seeing Dinosaur Jr. in, in California. Right. Here's a question for you. And I, who is the best performer, singer, front person you've ever seen well, you know i'm a kiss fan I mean, so you're gonna go with paul stanley uh, listen he's one of them that but i he's like the same per- thing he's such a he's fake well personally for me i because i i do enjoy paul stanley's performances i know. can't anymore you know why well, yeah well now it's you know, no no i'm I not mean, saying now but the guy does the same if you would have seen him pick any tour pick a tour where you think paul stanley's great at his best animalize you want to give me animalize you want to give me what well, give me a tour all right revenge animalize. okay whatever tour it is yeah you see him that night yeah the next night it's the same routine next night i know next night i know you, you could set me. your watch to it all right so besides him i'm gonna have to say just singer? Like Anything. What do, you what do you mean? I got mine, and it's not what, even what, close. What was the question again? Best front person, singer, whatever. Just front person. Yeah. That's tough right off for me to think of that. I'm hearing some weird shit in my headphones. I just sounded like the Predator was like yeah. over my right He's shoulder. Right behind you. Yeah. Like, that's what he sounded like in my ear. I'm like, oh my I, God, what the I hell's really, going on? That's something I really got to think about. I mean, I know I threw Paul out there. I thought you meant just front man. Right. You know? From person. Could be a woman, too. But that's what you meant, a front. Yeah. Okay. Singer. Maybe, besides that, maybe David Lee Roth. Okay. I thought he was brilliant back in the day. You saw him on the Eat Him and Smile tour? 
Yes, I did. A good job. Yeah, with uh, Steve I and uh, Sheen. Steve I too much live? Does he go know. too crazy? Yeah, or he to, it's, it, man, that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember the show, but I can't, you know, I think I remember the performance too well, but I think Poison opened up that night. I've seen Poison, and I've seen Tesla open up for Poison. Nice. Um, wasn't bad. It was a fun night. Tesla was great. Why not? It's music, man. Fun who, night. Who rock cares? and roll. That, that's all it is. Man. As long as you've got guitars and, you know, banging drums, it's you're going to have a good time, dude. Best performer, front person I've ever saw live, and it's not even close, is Adam Ant. And nobody comes close. He's He's got the vocal thing down. He's got, like, the dance and rhythm thing down. He's got the, the stage actor type thing. He uses the stage like like an actor would, you know? He doesn't necessarily use it as like a rock guy, yeah. even though he comes in and out of like the punk, he comes in and out of like the rock singer yeah. thing, but he also uses his stage in a way that a lot of Shakespeare actors use it in right. a way, but not over the top where you notice it. It's just perfect. He makes eye contact with you right. and he'll stay They'll keep that eye contact right on you. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with him, but I know some stuff from you know his moves and i saw him at the Fillmore right. in san francisco well i didn't know he was back in the day i didn't know he was like a total punk guy because when i knew him first of course was more like the, the don't drink don't smoke right. cr so crap i didn't know you yeah know, which is, I, but um of course i know you so i know now the earlier stuff with uh what they were called um the ants the ants okay and then they went to adam and the ants right so you know you learn stuff over the years you know uh, and i I love that. So I've seen him recently in New York and um, he's terrific. Um, getting back to shows though, um, I think that's, uh, I think that's it. I think, yeah. I mean, obviously every time I see Dinosaur Jr., it's great and it's different. Um, I seen Tool at Madison Square Garden. Nice. That was different. I remember leaving that show thinking, what the, f what the hell did I just watch? Yeah. Amazing band tool. You know, sometimes, you know, that tool song goes on for like 10 minutes type of thing, you know, and they, they have, it's the same thing you had. It seemed like they had five songs yeah, in, in, one? One, in one song. The riffs just kept changing and it right. went to something else. It's cool. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it, it works no, that's well for their them. Style. Yeah, it is. It works it's, well. It's like, it's like prog rock without the prog. Right. You know, it's yeah. just got the things. And they write well. I mean, to me, do. if I'm writing a song, I can't change that many directions in the song because it's not my, you know, that's not the formula I use to write music. Mm -hmm. But it's cool, though. You know what I'm saying? No, it's, I think it's great. And it I think Tool is an amazing band. But I often, you know, compare their songs to like reading an encyclopedia. Right. It's just, it's just too much. It I is prefer, a lot. that's why. It, when a drummer goes nuts, right? It's just like no stopping him, dude. He's doing stuff like it's like unheard of, man. It's like he's playing these, these off beats, but he's Tom work. I mean, that's just, why I like a perfect circle. Yeah, is because I get to hear Maynard's voice, which I love, right? In a three minute, four minute song. Yeah, and it to me that's so much more enjoyable yeah. than to go on that whole trip with Tool. Yeah, um, and I love the earlier Tool stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I love Opiate. Sure. You know, I, I love their first couple of records, but it's too much for me. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing at the same oh, time. Sure I saw is, them man. live. It was like, great. Oh, I bet it was. So, And they would probably be a better club band than an arena band. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? You want to see that shit up close and, yeah. and you feel the actual music. Yeah. That shit would probably go right through. Yeah. Amazing. Definitely. You know. Do you have any more shows? You know, dude, I went to a lot of shows. I don't know. Yeah, I can't even yeah, think about I know. how many I'm, right shows. Right now, it's like, I, I can't get any into my head. I know I've seen a lot of shows over the years. Of course, you know, Kiss has probably been over 20 times in my life. But What are the what are the next few, what are the dream shows you would love to see? Ugh. I know one's the Cardigans. I hope you guys come to the United States. They're probably never going to like watch this no, podcast or I, anything. I don't have one. Please come to the United States. Just come to New York <laughs> and play one show. Please. Just do that once. I, I do have one, but it will never happen. 
Because Deal died. Oh, you can't. I'm not saying if. But well, if I'm just saying when if, if people it would, are alive, if there is probably ain't one. Because I would have liked to see him with Blackmore one last time. Okay, so based on bands that are alive or could get back together today, mm. mine would definitely be the Cardigans. Nothing. I, I don't. You got nothing. No, because the majority of bands are still around. I mean, what are we gonna say? I mean, well, that's what I mean. Even if they're still around, who do you want to see? Not not some magical thing you want to get together. What are uh, what are some bands that are on your list? There isn't any really. Maybe well, um, if they got back to back, uh, Black Country Communion. Okay. With uh, Glenn Hughes and um, uh, Glenn Hughes better do it soon. <laughs> I don't know how that guy does it. I know, but the, the, I he's mean, the first album. You're talking about these singers and people in their seventies. He's, he's going to be in his eighties. Dude, that first album, Black Country Community, that's a good album. The rest of it kind of tail off a little bit, but I like to see them. They came to the Witcher Call, too, and I missed them uh, a while ago. Starland. Came to what? Oh. Still in ballroom. Uh -huh. I didn't go. I was like, fuck. Yeah, but again, always go to the I show know. when you get a chance to go. Amazing. Always. Um, so, we're going to get you to see Dinosaur Jr., because I think you would love that. Oh, uh -huh. definitely enjoy it. You know that. All right, so let's wrap okay, this one, one up. Good. Um, that's about it. So the message for this show, if you have a chance to go to a concert, go. Because you never know what the hell's going to happen. Yeah. Always go. Okay. All right, that's it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Never Image Radio Podcast. I'm Chris Donato. Stop doing it. Okay.